Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Um, and of course, if you haven't already had a chance to make a donation, please do so. Just as a reminder, all the wonderful events and support groups and classes that we offer at PD Active are all um, as a result of your generous donations. So please go ahead and make a donation when you can. Thank you. Um, so now I'd like to turn our attention to our speaker today is Matt Jacobson. And um, we're so fortunate to have Matt join us today. Um, Matt is a researcher, entrepreneur, and has the lived experience of Parkinson's disease. In addition, we have the added benefit of him being a local just across the bay over in San Francisco. As you know, PD Active is a local organization and we love hosting local talent from UCSF and Stanford and all the wonderful organizations um, around us. Um, Matt is a faculty member in the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry at UCSF, and he's currently serving as the chair of that department. He earned his PhD in physical chemistry at MIT and then completed his postdocs at Oxford and Columbia University. Matt has been at UCSF for nearly a decade, or two decades, I think, almost. Um, he's the author of over 180 publications, a textbook, as well as some software that is widely used in the pharmaceutical interest. Matt lectures widely and teaches at UCSF, and he has actually generously made the content of one of his recent UCSF classes available online. And I'll drop that a link in the chat shortly. I highly encourage you to look at it. He talks a lot about um, the physiology of Parkinson's and some really interesting drug therapeutic strategies. Um, so in 2012, shortly before turning 40, Matt was actually diagnosed with Parkinson's. However, as you can see from his professional portfolio, his interest in neurological diseases predated his diagnosis of Parkinson's. Um, in addition to teaching and research, Matt's quest for a cure for Parkinson's has led to co-founding of six biotech companies, including two that are now listed on the NASDAQ. Um, he is wor working currently on new therapeutics for Parkinson's, both at UCSF and with one of his companies, Nine Square Therapeutics. If you're interested in reading more about his lab and his team and his companies, please see his other website, um, jacobsonlab.wordpress.com, and I'll put that in the chat shortly as well. So as you can see, Matt is a wealth of knowledge on the subject of pharma therapeutics, and we're so fortunate to have him not only to share his professional journey on the quest for a cure, but his personal relationship with Parkinson's as well. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over uh, to you, Matt. Oh, thanks very much for that introduction. Okay. Um, does that look proper? in terms of the presentation mode. All right, excellent. All right. So yeah, I'm gonna start just a little bit with my my story of uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, as Monique mentioned, I um, was diagnosed at age 39, which is unusual. This is a chart of, um, you know, basically how common Parkinson's disease is at different ages. Um, and, you know, you can see, you know, after age 60, it becomes fairly common. Um, one odd thing about this graph is you can see that, you know, it's uh, significantly uh, more prevalent in men than, than women. It's something we still don't understand very well, actually. Um, but yeah, at age 39, it's, it's rare, but hardly unheard of. Michael J. Fox was diagnosed at about age 33. Um, and I met uh, one young woman who was actually diagnosed um, as a teenager. Um, and I, I think this makes a, a simple but important point, which is, you know, that Parkinson's is a disease. Um, and, you know, at age 70, there's a tendency to sort of just say, well, you know, just getting old, you know, this is normal, but it's not. Um, uh, it, it's it's absolutely uh, something that can be treated at any age um, and is, is a result of an underlying process that is pretty much the same, whether you get it, um, you know, young in life or, or much later. Uh, and it's treated uh, pretty much exactly the same way. So I'm going to start with a few just basic things. This is, I took these slides from lectures I give to the pharmacy students at UCSF. Um, you know, most of you probably already know this, but it just, uh, you know, I think it's important to set the stage for 
um, what I'm going to talk about, which is, uh, you know, the drugs that are available for Parkinson's disease. A lot of exciting developments just over the last few years. So, you know, what is the disease? It's actually quite simple to describe. There's, uh, you know, very important neurotransmitter in the brain called dopamine, which uh, is produced actually in a very tiny little portion of the brain. Here you can see in this cut through the brain, um, you know, it's deep, deep inside your head. Uh, and it's a tiny little portion of the brain, just a few percent of the cells at most that produce all the dopamine for the brain. And, uh, you know, basically in Parkinson's disease, these cells die. And it's as simple as that. Uh, you can see that upon autopsy that the, the, the cells are, are dead. Um, and, you know, dopamine is pretty darn important. So uh, if you don't have enough or you have very little, then a lot of bad things happen. I mean, the most famous um, functions of dopamine have to do with movement. And of course, you know, you have the, the classic Parkinson's tremor and whatnot. Um, I actually never had the, the, the classic Parkinson's resting tremor. Um, I have something called an intention tremor. Uh, you can maybe see it a little bit as I uh, uh, move my hand in any sort of intentional motion, um, which, you know, combined with uh, the age at which I, I got Parkinson's disease, um, you know, made it a little uncertain, you know, was, was this the correct diagnosis? Is this not? Uh, they were worried, you know, was it ALS or something like that? Um, but you know, one thing that's become very clear over the last few years is that um, although the motor symptoms, you know, walking and, you know, tremors and whatnot are uh, the easiest thing to see, uh, the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease are probably at least as impactful. I mean, patients have already always known this. Um, but unfortunately, the, the drugs available for Parkinson's, you know, they tend to work pretty well on the motor symptoms, a little less well sometimes on some of the non-motor symptoms. Saw someone once who had a, a tattoo of a, a dopamine. Um, there's sort of a, uh, a sense that it's like the happiness molecule. That's, you know, not quite right, but it's absolutely true that dopamine is required for uh, certain feelings of uh, pleasure. And so most illegal drugs um, or many illegal drugs, uh, things like cocaine and whatnot, lead to a burst of dopamine in the brain. And that leads to that sense of euphoria that winds up being highly addictive and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, obviously in Parkinson's, it's just the opposite. You don't have enough. And so you can't feel um, uh, that sort of feeling of intense happiness or euphoria. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, then, uh, people with Parkinson's are uh, less uh, likely to become addicted to various drugs. Um, I'm very happy to hear that you guys are going to be hearing from a um, voice uh, therapist. It's something I highly recommend. Out of all the symptoms of Parkinson's, the ones that worry me the most, uh, particularly late in the disease, are really just two of them. Uh, falls, uh, of course, can be very serious. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll come back to that later. But uh, swallowing problems leading to inhalation pneumonia is a major cause of mortality late in the disease. Um, but importantly, it is one that is uh, you know, partially treatable or preventable through uh, voice and swallowing training. And uh, so it's something I recommend. I, I've done it myself, uh, partly because of swallowing problems, but mainly because, you know, I have to get up in front of, uh, you know, 100 students and give lectures and things like that. And so, <clears throat> you know, projecting my voice is something that's difficult to do with Parkinson's, but you absolutely can uh, train, you can, you can get better at it. Um, and a, a good voice therapist is very much worth the effort. Okay. So yeah, since I was diagnosed, I mean, I, I've done a lot of things. I, uh, 
you know, I was chair of my department for, for five years. I've started various companies, including Nine Square, which I'll mention briefly at the end, a company dedicated mainly to uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, but I also, you know, don't want to give the sense that it's easy. On the right is a picture, a selfie I took in, in the hospital uh, after uh, an unfortunate plane flight where uh, I went unconscious basically and uh, uh, due to uh, something related to Parkinson's disease called uh, uh, Sorry, uh, I'm having, this is a teaching moment. Uh, I'm having what's called tip of the tongue syndrome. Uh, so it's kind of interesting because one of the things that dopamine seems to be involved in is retrieval from your memory bank. Uh, it's different from Alzheimer's disease. What people will say is, you know, in Alzheimer's disease, the memory or the word or, or whatnot that you're looking for is just not there. In Parkinson's disease, it's actually there, uh, but it's being able to pull it out of your brain. <laughs> Somehow dopamine is important for that. And that leads to this tip of the tongue syndrome where particularly if you're not well medicated and you know, I just woke up and so I'm still uh, getting there. Uh, sometimes you wind up searching for the word, you know what's in your brain somewhere. It can be very frustrating not to be able to, to pull it out. Uh, but basically what's going on here is, you know, I had an episode of, um, low blood pressure um, and this is fairly typical in parkinson's disease and something that uh, can lead to a lot of trouble because if your blood pressure suddenly drops especially after standing up uh, can lead to a fall and so this is one of the symptoms i think is uh, less well known but very important uh, because it, if it does lead to falls, that can lead to substantial, you know, degradation and quality of life, and it can be treated, uh, which is very important. So I will mention that briefly in a moment. Okay, so that's, you know, a very brief story there. I've had Parkinson's disease for about 10 years now. Um, and in that time, it's kind of amazing, um, you know, circa 2012, when I was diagnosed, there hadn't been new FDA approvals for Parkinson's disease in quite some time, actually. Um, and then all of a sudden, sort of starting in 2014, roughly, there were just a whole bunch of new FDA approvals. So this is this is undeniably good news. Now, I want to be clear. I mean, none of these things cure Parkinson's disease or even slow down the progression of it. Um, but these are very helpful for basically two different things. I mean, in green are ones uh, which are all dedicated to trying to just improve quality of life for people with Parkinson's disease by improving on time without dyskinesia. We'll define that a little bit more precisely before, but most Parkinson's patients are familiar with the concept of, you know, you take a pill and then, you know, you feel pretty good for a while and then eventually it wears off. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't feel too great until you take the next pill. And these various options basically help with that. I think the, what the, the idea I'd like to leave you with is what if it were possible to never have an off state again, to just always be on? And I think that is now possible with the right combination of these various options that are available to you. And so I would love to see a world where people with Parkinson's disease don't have to deal with on-off cycling. There's kind of like this um, side benefit to this that it, um, if implemented properly, can also reduce the amount of dyskinesia, uh, which is also related to this on-off uh, cycling. The second category of new drugs is really treatments for non-motor um, symptoms. There's a couple of these that are not well known, but potentially useful. Um, one of these over on the right here uh, is 
basically Botox uh, injection. Um, you know, it's obviously it's well known um, in in use for uh, you know basically cosmetic purposes, but it has a number of important medical um, uses as well. And so the FDA explicitly approved this for basically excessive drooling in Parkinson's. Um, I don't know where they inject it exactly, somewhere around the mouth and lips, I assume. And uh, it, it works. Um, and, you know, it, although that doesn't sound like a very, you know, severe symptom, you know, it, it's a quality of life issue. And, uh, you know, so it's good to know about. Um, the other two in blue here are drugs that are a little bit more controversial, I would say, but still worth knowing about. So this orthostatic hypotension is just the medical term for what I described earlier, this uh, low blood pressure. So most people, um, especially in the US, deal with hypertension, high blood pressure. Um, and some people with Parkinson's disease do as well. But orthostatic hypotension is something kind of specific to Parkinson's disease. And the orthostatic part means um, after you stand up. So I actually had an episode of this just a few minutes before this uh, seminar started. Um, uh, you know, I was uh, eating some breakfast and uh, got very dizzy all of a sudden. So I had to lie down. Uh, so that's the first thing you know is if you do get this uh, dizziness, you know, standing up, uh, you know, the the way to deal with it acutely is just to uh, get your head lower, and uh, the dizziness is essentially arising from not enough blood getting to your brain, which is never a good thing. Um, when I had uh, that incident on an airplane, uh, when I uh, became conscious again, uh, they were measuring my blood pressure and it was 70 over 40, you know, so extremely low. So it can crash, you know, very fast and it can be quite serious. Uh, so in 2014, there's this new drug approved uh, specifically for orthostatic hypertension. So if this is something that you uh, suffer from, it's worth knowing about. Um, it's a little bit controversial because it was approved on the basis of a relatively short clinical trial. We don't know much about you know, the long-term impacts of taking the drug, et cetera. Um, but uh, nonetheless, if you do have orthostatic hypotension, very important to talk to um, your movement disorder specialist, um, because even if it's not this drug, there are, are ways to treat it. Todd, is there a question? Matt, can I interject and just mm -hmm. ask you to quickly define orthostatic hypotension? Yeah, it's it's simply um, a sudden onset of low blood pressure uh, due specifically to standing up. That's the orthostatic part. And so when you think about it, you know, um, you know, when you go from like say lying down to standing up, your body has to do a lot of things to ensure that you still get enough uh, blood to your brain. Um, you know, giraffes have a serious problem because, you know, pumping uh, blood up that high into their brain is very, very difficult. We have a little bit of that problem. Um, and it's not totally clear why Parkinson's disease patients have this problem specifically. And the unusual thing about it, it's very, very difficult to, to catch. So if you just go to your doctor and say, me measure my blood pressure, and you're just sitting there in the chair, they're not going to see it. They're going to say, yeah, your blood pressure is normal. What are you talking about? But it can happen, you know, usually about, you know, one to two minutes is typical after you stand up. And it can go down very suddenly uh, where you feel dizzy. Got it. Thank you creating a fairly dangerous situation. Yeah, so this other, um, I mean, sorry, the, the other simple things you can do for, for the hypertension is just make sure you stay well hydrated and stuff like that. Um, uh, so this other approval in 2016, new Plazid, um, early in Parkinson's disease progression, Generally, there's little uh, dementia or 
um, psychosis. Um, and in fact, if there's dementia at uh, the time that you have Parkinsonian symptoms, it, it sort of by, defini by definition means that it's not Parkinson's disease. Uh, but later in the disease progression, the disease essentially can spread to other parts of the brain and you can start winding up with uh, symptoms of dementia, which is really not treatable, uh, unfortunately, at this time. Um, but these um, you know, so-called psychosis symptoms, which can include hallucinations, which I think is another of your upcoming um, seminar series, a very important topic very complex topic because sometimes things like hallucinations can be due to the disease itself and sometimes they can be symptoms of uh, drugs that you're taking for the disease uh, the one that's um, particularly notorious for it um, is uh, apomorphine uh, which uh, is not used as much these days um, but yeah, important to keep in mind that these symptoms can start occurring. And for better or worse, the typical antipsychotics that are used, things like Haldol and whatnot, are absolutely should not be used for Parkinson's patients. Most antipsychotics work by depressing the dopamine systems in the brain. That's the absolute opposite of what you should do with a Parkinson's patient. And yet it happens all the time. My grandfather also happens to have Parkinson's disease. It was diagnosed much later in life. So it's not clear that it's related to, you know, my Parkinson's disease or anything like that. Um, but uh, he was in the hospital and they um, gave him some antipsychotics and it, it frankly nearly killed him. It was kind of shocking um, sort of medical malpractice. So there's been a lot of interest um, over the years in you know, uh, the use of what are called atypical antipsychotics for Parkinson's disease. There are various uh, options available that have been used off-label uh, by doctors. Off-label just means that you know, it wasn't specifically approved for Parkinson's disease, but doctors prescribe it anyways, which is very much allowed. Um, but in 2016, this new um, medicine was approved specifically for Parkinson's disease. Um, you know, again, it's, it's a relatively new medicine. So, you know, experience with it is, is still developing, um, but it is worth talking to a doctor about um, if you have some of these more serious uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms like uh, hallucinations, and uh, you have reason to believe that they're not related to um, any drugs that you're taking. And this is not even all of the options that are available. This is just uh, uh, a few of them. There's at least five other drug approvals, um, which I left off of here because they're maybe slightly less important. And then just this year alone, there's a couple more. Um, I put these on here just because they're, they're interesting because they're not drugs. So one is an FDA approval to use an Apple Watch to track your Parkinson's symptoms. This is something that's been, you know, knocking around for a long time. Um, Andy Grove, uh, the former um, head of uh, Intel, uh, used to, uh, had, had Parkinson's disease, and he was very interested in this concept of um, uh, using, you know, like an iPhone or, or, or a watch or something like that to to be able to track things like tremor. I mean, it makes sense, you know, if, uh, if you're, you know, if you're uh, looking at tremor that you can, you know, be able to capture that with the, um, with the little gyroscope in essence that's inside of your iPhone or your Apple Watch. And uh, it's, it's very interesting because in principle, uh, it could help patients ultimately to try to optimize um, uh, their own medication regimen. In the short run, I think it's gonna be used mainly for clinical trials as a way to evaluate how effective drug therapies are um, kind of on a 
24 hour a day round the clock basis as opposed to just you know coming into the doctor once every couple of weeks and um you know them you know having you do the the finger taps and stuff like that um the second one is very interesting because it's uh, a non-invasive way of treating advanced Parkinson's based on bla basically blasting ultrasound right into your brain. Kind of a, you know, I, I don't know how they came up with this idea, um, but it, it appears to be effective for some patients. Um, and it's essentially an alternative to the other uh, major um, surgical intervention, which involves planting electrodes in your brain. Um, and possibly, you know, for some patients who are considering doing that surgery, well, this is a non-invasive thing. They don't have to drill a hole through the back of your skull and all that stuff. Um, so it's, it's very new, uh, but a number of hospitals are starting to provide it, um, including at least one in the Bay Area. Um, I think both uh, UCSF and Stanford are planning to um, uh, provide it and maybe more. So it's just something to know about. And I'll just emphasize again, um, you know, it's, that it's important to talk to your doctor about these things, but, you know, let me be clear, you know, talking to, you know, just a family practitioner, you know, um, a general practitioner is not helpful. They will not know about these things. Um, you know, basically, uh, you know, what they know about Parkinson's disease is probably what they learned in medical school, you know, how many ever years ago. And so much is changing so quickly. The only people who are really on top of it are movement disorder specialists, which are neurologists who specialize in Parkinson's ALS and a small number of other um, such diseases. Um, and so it, if there's one piece of advice I could give you, it's, you know, make sure you find a movement disorder specialist. I mean, luckily, if you live in the Bay Area, um, you should be able to, to do that. Other parts of the country, you know, that's maybe not an option. Okay. But uh, despite all that progress, um, you know, the mainstay of Parkinson's treatment is still levodopa um, 60 years ago. Um, it's actually interesting because it was one of the first um, well-controlled uh, clinical trials um, approved by the FDA, um, you know, made famous by uh, movie that Robin Williams was in called Awakenings, uh, some of the early stages of that, um, of that discovery. Uh, Robin Williams, by the way, I mean, he was uh, later diagnosed with Parkinson's disease incorrectly, as it turns out. Um, uh, he, uh, after he died, his brain came to UCSF where they did uh, an autopsy on it and discovered that uh, he had a disease called Lewy body dementia. Uh, but if you look online, uh, you know, Robin Williams, you'll still see articles there that say he had uh, Parkinson's disease. And, you know, that emphasizes that it's, it's still, you know, tricky to diagnose these things sometimes. Uh, the key uh, indicator that, you know, his doctor should have known that it wasn't Parkinson's was that he had uh, very severe neuropsychiatric symptoms um, uh, uh, early on in the disease. Um, okay, so levodopa, what is it? It's basically just, uh, you know, if Parkinson's is a disease where you don't have enough dopamine, well, take some dopamine, right? I mean, it's, uh, that's basically what it is. Uh, except that it turns out that if you swallow dopamine, it causes terrible intestinal cramping. So instead of taking dopamine, you take uh, this levodopa, which is, you know, you don't need to be able to read these uh, uh, chemical structures to recognize that they're quite similar to each other. Um, and this is, in fact, how dopamine is created in your brain. It's created from levodopa. And uh, the basic problem in Parkinson's, you don't have enough of it, so... 
take some in a pill. So it's a great, it's a great drug. Um, it's just replacing what's missing. Um, and it's extraordinarily effective drug, and that's why it's still the gold standard 60 years later. The names you know you see on the bottle of drugs are things like Cinemet, Carbidopa, Levodopa, Stilevo, Matopar, Rider. There's many different names for it, uh, but it's all the same stuff. There's a lot of myths about Levodopa out there. I emphasize this a lot on my uh, website because um, I've just seen a lot of these uh, myths sort of um, causing Parkinson's disease patients to avoid taking Levodopa. Um, and that's unfortunate because it is so very effective. Um, there's a myth that um, even among some doctors who really should know better that there, there's this myth that it stops working after you've used it for many years. That's absolutely false. Um, it becomes more difficult to control the symptoms after you've used it for many years, but that's because the disease has progressed. It's not because the, uh, the drug has stopped working. There's uh, sort of like uh, scary headlines that I've seen in some, uh, some places, you know, that levodopa is toxic. That's absolute nonsense. Um, I've emphasized that it's, you know, the idea that it's somehow unnatural is, is silly. I mean, it's exactly the same stuff that's in your brain. Um, and so, you know, although there was um, sort of a, a tendency in, you know, especially 10 to 20 years ago to try to minimize the use of levodopa, even to the point where people were not controlling their symptoms very well. Um, and it's, it's become absolutely clear that that's the wrong approach. Um, uh, there was especially a tendency, less so on the West Coast, more so on the East Coast, to not give newly diagnosed Parkinson's patients levodopa to use other drugs first. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a horrible decision, but there's, um, but if uh, the symptoms are not well controlled by, by other drugs, um, there's absolutely no reason why newly diagnosed patients can't use it. I've used it since day one um, of diagnosis. Uh, in fact, uh, levodopa is how I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. They weren't totally sure, you know, this is Parkinson's. So they said, well, give you levodopa if it <clears throat> solves your symptoms and it's Parkinson's, right? Um, and, uh, you know, within 15 minutes of, of taking it, I knew that that's what it was. There's really only one problem with it. It's a pretty significant problem though, is that after you take the pill, you know, especially later in the disease, after about two, three hours, it's gone. And so, you know, the ideal when you're doing drug development, like I do, is you always want to aim for one at once a day pill. You know, you take it when you first wake up or, you know, before you go to bed or, you know, after dinner or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's easy for patients to remember. Um, but, you know, that's not possible with levodopa at all. Um, if it's gone after two to three hours, well, then you go into these off periods, which just means, you know, you're back to having Parkinson's again. Um, so dealing with this is hard. And this, you know, not only leads to the on-off cycling, but uh, the spikiness, the, you know, shooting up and down, you know, the uh, dopamine levels in your brain cycling up and down like that is basically what leads to dyskinesias, especially later in the disease. So how do we deal with this one problem? This is, a, a, I like this, um, this is a handwritten symptom diary by a Parkinson's patient, not, not me. Um, I just kind of like how, um, you know, they, they drew out, you know, their symptoms. So um, this, this line going up and down here is basically, showing you know whether they're on or off so on means they're doing pretty well off means they've got all their symptoms there's a couple of interesting points about about this uh little diagram that i think are interesting so this particular individual you know wakes up every day at about 7 a.m 
And uh, you can't really read it on the bottom left, but it says not able to go back to sleep because they have terrible tremors waking up in the morning. It makes total sense, right? If the last pill you took was, you know, like 10 p.m., 11 p.m. or whatever, um, you know, it's all gone from your body. So you wake up, you've got, you know, all of your Parkinson's symptoms. And I found this very interesting um, that they wait an hour to take the first pill. Why do they wait an hour? Well, probably because the doctor said, well, take two Cinemed at 8 a.m., take your next ones at noon, your next ones at 4 p.m. or whatever, you know? There's absolutely no reason to wait, okay? Um, when you wake up in the morning, take it right away. Matt, I have a, can I interject a quick question here? Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of the reasons why maybe people wait sometimes is because the doctors say don't take your medication or don't take dopamine with protein. Yeah. So maybe people could That's, try and alternate their meds around their meals. What, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's um, that's a myth too. Um, I've extensively researched this. Um, eating protein does not interfere with dopamine absorption. That's absolutely false. Um, and even some movement disorders specialists believe that, um, but they're wrong. <laughs> um, there, there may be some impact on symptoms, but it has nothing to do with, um, with uh, absorption of, of the drug. And in any case, you know, taking the first thing in the morning, your stomach's empty. So, you know, within 15 minutes, you know, 30 minutes max, you'll start feeling the benefits. That's really good to know. I can tell you that that's been bantied about a lot the protein versus oh yeah yeah a debate and you should throw that up on your myths slide when you have a minute yeah it's um up on my website there's a whole discussion of it um you know why people thought that in the first place and it's been debunked by literally like you know half a dozen different studies right. um, um it's one of those things that you know it, when you actually do sort of drug discovery and stuff, it doesn't actually really make any sense. But um, yeah, so, you know, you, you don't have to worry too much about exactly when uh, when you take it relative to meals. Um, it's hard enough to <laughs> control your symptoms without that, um, without that uh, uh, issue. So yeah, there's, there's no... Uh, reason to wait um, in the morning. Um, and then you can see, you know, pretty fast after taking the pills, this person feels pretty good, um, but not for very long, an hour or so, and then bam, off state again. Um, and then they don't take another pill until, you know, close to noon or something like that. And then eventually, you know, they start feeling good again and then down again, you know. Uh, very frustrating. So does it have to be this way? And so if I could, you know, leave you with one idea is, you know, I, I don't think it does. Now, that being said, it takes work <laughs> um, uh, to do this. But um, so what do I do instead? I don't have um, these extreme up downs, but I'm a little bit uh, crazy. I um, take levodopa about um, eight to 10 times a day. Okay. Mm. So, you know, this particular individual takes two cinnamon at 8 a.m. What I would do instead is take one at 7 a.m. and another one at, you know, nine or 10. Okay. So the same amount, but just, you know, splitting it up. I actually take half pills. I take one upon first waking, and then I take half pills about every 90 minutes. And so that's extreme. Most patients are not willing to do that. But for me, it's a small price to pay um, to not have to do this up down all the time. And you're finding right. that does uh, alleviate some of the roller coaster effect. Yeah, absolutely. Because the roller coaster effect is almost entirely due to, um, you know, the Medication. clearing out of your system in about two hours or whatever. So if you take it about every two hours, then you avoid a lot of this uh, 
uh, roller coaster effect. This chart yeah. is interesting, though. I think that chart is terrific, probably a terrific way to start. Would you agree that, that somebody sort of starts to document their progression? And yeah, their, absolutely. And, and, and I think, you know, absolutely. And that's uh, ultimately, I think what, you know, some of these like, you know, Apple Watch and stuff like that will probably allow you to do this, you know, sort of automatically. Right. But, you know, I'll bet if we were able to measure the level of dopamine in this person's brain, that it would that this would be a pretty accurate description <laughs> of the levels of dopamine um, because you can feel it. You absolutely know um, whether you've got enough dopamine in your brain or not. So with your busy, with your busy teaching and reworking and schedule, I mean, how logistically, how do you remember to take the dopamine every 90 minutes? <laughs> What's the trick here? Yeah. Um, I just use, um, uh, uh, alarms on my, my, wa on my watch or my, my iPhone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, there are special apps that, that you can use that will, you know, you just put in the time that you're supposed to take it or whatever, and it'll give you reminders. Um, you know, there's any number of, of ways of, of doing it. Honestly, at this point, I can just kind of uh, feel when it's, uh, when it's time. And uh, speaking of which, it's about time. So uh, bear with me just one moment. Yeah. Uh, um. And an interesting sort of follow-up to that would be, you know, are there, you know, there's so many extended release versions of drugs and is there an extended release version of levodopa? And if so, why wouldn't one just be, you know, taking that at, at longer yeah. intervals? Yeah, great question. I will come to that in just a moment. Okay. Um, by the way, this is how I carry around my pills in a little Altoids box. So, you know, even if you're, you know, sensitive about not looking like you're, uh, you know, taking pills or whatever, you know, everybody thinks I'm just taking an Altoid. That's um, okay. It's totally okay to just chew them and, you know, it doesn't taste great, but it's not as bad as some drugs. Um, okay, um, other options that are available. So, um, this is now following up on um, the question that was just asked. Um, there is a variety of so-called extended released um, formulations of levodopa or cinnamon. Um, one of them is shown here on the right, uh, this is called Writery. Um, and it's it's pretty impressive, actually. It um, it seems to be able to give people about six hours of benefit. Um, at least that's the claim. Uh, when I've talked to to patients who have used it, it's maybe not quite that good, but um, but still much better than you know two hours or something like that. It is a little bit of a pain to switch over for a couple of reasons. One is um, you have to change uh, your dose a bit. So um, because writery is not absorbed quite as well, you have to use a little higher dose. And so, you know, there's some adjustment that comes along with that. Um, the other issue is uh, reimbursement. Um, a lot of, um, I tried to get some of it at one point and they just said, no, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, if your insurance will pay for it, um, then it's definitely worth considering. I use extended release formulations um, at night, um, and there's absolutely there's no reason you can't take uh, um, take it at at night. Um, you know, most Parkinson's patients get up at least once during the night, um, and so by taking it you know, when I'm, when I wake up at 3 a.m. or whatever, um, then there's at least some in my system when I wake up in the morning. So I'm not starting from zero. That can be a little bit helpful. Um, the other one I would definitely recommend considering or talking to your uh, doctor about is uh, Azelect Resagiline. So this is sometimes used in newly diagnosed patients um, uh, in, in lieu of uh, levodopa. 
Um, it has, you know, some benefit by itself, but its main use, in my view, is as an, um, an extra, you know, an adjunct to, to levodopa. It slows down the rate at which dopamine is sort of uh, cleared out of your system. Um, and uh, so it gets you basically, you know, maybe about an extra hour um, of on time. Um, relative to not using it. So, you know, if it's, you know, usually you're sort of cycling after about two hours, well, this might get you three. Um, and it's quite a good drug, actually. It's it's quite clean. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, the, the main disadvantage was that um, it, up until a few years ago it was still on patents. So it was kind of expensive, but now there's um, a very cheap um, generic version of it available. Uh, so definitely worth uh, thinking about. One of the more extreme options is the one on the left called um, Duopa in the, U in the U.S. It's not widely used in the U.S., but it is in Europe under the name Duodopa. The idea here is um, you put a little tube um, uh, directly into your gut, um, and then you have like this little pouch of um, levodopa infusion. Um, and uh, this little device basically pumps the levodopa directly into your gut. And it uh, it just gives you a little pulse of it like every minute, basically, right? So it's like taking my strategy of just taking it really frequently to like the extreme, right? You know, taking a little tiny, teeny tiny dose every minute. And uh, that's, it's quite effective. I mean, uh, basically it means there is no off time, uh, literally none. Right, I mean, at least while you're awake. Um, but it does require surgery to put the tube in. A number of people um, have to wind up taking it out because uh, of infection or something like that. Um, and uh, you know, it's extraordinarily expensive. Uh, the list price is you know something north of a hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, so. You know, insurance companies are very hesitant to to pay for it, um, but it's it's worth uh, asking about in the more uh, you know uh, later stages of Parkinson's, where the on-off cycling is a very serious issue. And like I said, you know, it's widely used in Europe um, quite effectively, actually. These are some new options that became available just in the past couple of years. These, the idea here is, you know, suppose you go into an off state, um, but, you know, you're not really supposed to take your pill until, you know, an hour or two from now. Is there something you can do to just sort of um, get you through that off state um, until it's time to take the next pill? So there's two options available so far. I think another one's been knocking around. One of them is these, uh, I don't know if you've ever tried like Listerine strips. They're basically like that. Um, you just stick it on your tongue and um, it, uh, you know, it, it's, it gives you a benefit for just an hour or so, you know, um, uh, to sort of uh, keep you from going into a full off state, keep you functional until your next dose of levodopa. Uh, the other one is this um, oral inhaler thing um, that can basically accomplish the same thing. So very, very quickly, um, you know, you, you get the benefit from these within minutes, uh, a little bit faster than taking a pill. That Matt, being do said- Do you personally use either of these um, no. rescue dosing? No. No. Yeah, because, you know, the thing is you take, a pill, the pill and um, you can get benefit within about 15 minutes. Um, you know, and you, even if there's a little trick you can do if you dissolve your pill in like some sparkling water, then, you know, sometimes within minutes you can feel it. And the inhalable um, levodopa <laughs> option, Matt, is my neuro told me that that was considered better used by later stage patients? Is that the case and why? Well, I guess just because it's, uh, you know, Rest the severe on off cycling is more of an issue in later stage patients, but, um, you know, there's no particular reason it can't be used 
I mean, by anybody who's having on off cycling, you know, the only concern about any, any sort of inhaled medication like that can lead to, you know, some long irritation and stuff. So, you know, it, uh, I mean, obviously the FDA wouldn't approve it if, if they didn't think that the trade-off was worthwhile, but, um, you know, it, it is, uh, there are some side effects from taking it that way. Um, anyway, so, you know, it, in all these things were, were not available 10 years ago. So it's, it's worth trying to take advantage of some of these if, if you think they might uh, help you. And everybody's going to have to figure out what the best strategy is. Um, at the same time, um, you know, it's important to keep in mind that you know, the drugs can only go so far. Um, uh, there's other things you can and should be doing. Uh, you know, we already talked about the voice training, swallowing issues. Um, people have said it many times, but I'll say it too, you know, if exercise were a drug, it would be a blockbuster. Um, it's, and this is not just a generic sort of, well, exercise is good for you. Um, obviously it is, but, um, but specifically for Parkinson's, people have done clinical trials showing unambiguously that it's as effective as many drugs um, at improving symptoms. And uh, it's one of the few things that might plausibly actually slow progression of the disease. It hasn't been proven, I don't think, but um, on the if I had to sort of uh, blur my eyes and swallow hard, I'd say, yeah, it probably slows progression a bit. Um, the other one is, you know, don't forget um, to treat, uh, um, you know, depression is very common in, in Parkinson's patients. I mean, if dopamine is important for happiness, not having enough, you know, it's going to lead to depression. Simple as that. Um, and, you know, there's, of course, a number of effective drugs for depression. You'll kind of have to sort out on your own which one is most effective for you. It's a pain. You know, it'd probably start you out on um, a standard um, SSRI, um, uh, uh, which uh, helps some people, but not everybody. Um, but importantly, there's also non-drug interventions for uh, depression that can be very effective and cognitive behavioral training in particular has been shown in you know, some fairly impressive clinical trials to be quite effective for Parkinson's patients specifically, um, even helping to improve motor symptoms, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, uh, it's, you know, it's mainly meant to improve uh, depression and anxiety, um, but uh, very effective. So, you know, one way or another, treat uh, the non-motor symptoms if you can, and uh, whether that's through drug therapy or, um, or psychotherapy of, of some sort, uh, such as cognitive behavioral training. And finally, um, you know, the surgical option, the deep brain stimulation where you put the electrodes, you know, through a hole in your skull into your brain. Um, it used to be kind of a gnarly uh, procedure where you had to be kind of like pseudo awake for it. <laughs> um, they gave you propofol because you had to be able to um, communicate with the doctors while they were doing it to make sure that the electrodes were in the right place. That's no longer the case. Now it's done uh, with patients asleep under an MRI and it's robotically guided and with robotically guided surgery, they're able to plant the electrodes within like, you know, like a millimeter of, of where they want it, you know, just very, very precise. Um, UCSF does a fantastic job on this um, uh, surgery. I've, I've met some people who it really transformed their lives. I'd say, you know, my doctor brings it up all the time, you know, do I want to get this surgery? You know, am I a good candidate for it? I, you know, my answer is always no, um, partly because, um, you know, the, it's, the deep brain stimulation has been shown to be highly effective for motor symptoms, um, less so for the non-motor symptoms. And um, if there can be some cognitive 
issues that come out of it um, uh, as sort of negative side effects. And, you know, so in the job that I do where, you know, uh, my brain is my, <laughs> is my only asset, um, uh, that's a lousy trade-off for me. Um, but uh, for some people, this is a good option. Um, by the way, people who get this surgery, it's not like they necessarily go to like zero um, levodopa or something like that. I and mean, many still take it to some extent, but it, it tends to reduce the amount of um, drug therapy you have to use um, and can be quite effective uh, for especially tremor, um, if tremor is the main um, issue that you have. Okay, so uh, we're, we're going on almost an hour already, so I'm going to um, uh, just finish up with just a few thoughts about what's what's going to happen in the future um, that's going to ultimately transform Parkinson's um, disease. I mean, as I've said, I think, you know, there's been a lot of positive advances in the last few years, but nothing um, that would be considered a cure or anything close to it. In the near term, in terms of drug therapies, the one that uh, I have the most hope for um, uh, by far is uh, a drug being developed by a company called Denali in South San Francisco. Uh, one of my former uh, students works there. It's um, specifically for a protein called LARC2, which is a genetic cause of Parkinson's disease for some people, including uh, like Sergey Brin's mother, um, and he carries that uh, gene mutation. So you know, there's been a lot of interest in, in LARC2 as a target. Um, it, it looks like it's uh, quite a good drug. And so it's going to go into um, uh, kind of a penultimate clinical trial in the next few years. And uh, there's a real chance that it could be shown to not cure the disease, but at least in some patients, slow it down. And that would be a huge advance if that comes to pass. We'll see. Um, you know, to actually, you know, if you think about it, I mean, what would a cure look like? I mean, you know, these these cells producing the dopamine are already dead, right? So, you know, you can't revive them once they're dead. And even on the day you're diagnosed, probably at least half of them are already dead. And, you know, 10 years in or something, maybe 80% are gone. So a cure is going to have to look like somehow regrowing these cells. And that sounds like, you know... Star Trek uh, science fiction stuff, but, you know, it's not crazy. Um, you know, there's, it, it, there's basically two approaches to do this. One would be a gene therapy where basically you cause, um, uh, well, either new cells to grow or, you know, some other cells that are there start producing dopamine. And um, this has actually been tried many times over the past few decades. Um, without a whole lot of success, but there's there's been a few anecdotal successes. You know, one of these decades that might actually work. Um, Cell-based therapies, um, this in, will probably involve, you know, either collecting stem cells directly from a patient or more likely taking um, fibroblasts as just a skin punch, so it's uh, not very invasive. Re, uh, training those cells into... Um, uh, induce pluripotent stem cells, and then those can be then transformed into uh, dopaminergic neurons, and then, you know, drill a little hole in the back of your brain, and then plant them in the right part of your brain, and they can start growing again. And, you know, this stuff is, you know, and people are trying this in animals, and um, even a few patients, it, um, it might work. The, to the extent that it has these types of strategies have worked in some small clinical trials. There is, there is a downside to it. So there, there were actually a few patients back like almost 20 years ago who had a, a, a gene therapy treatment. They absolutely started growing some new uh, dopamine producing cells. Some of them stopped taking levodopa entirely for a period of time. And then 
it's very interesting. And then some of those patients subsequently died just, you know, old age really. Um, and they did an autopsy and they saw there were new cells there. It absolutely worked, but they started to de degenerate and die too. So it, it probably, you know, even though it, it, it slows down progression of the disease, it's probably not quite a cure because um, whatever was causing the underlying degeneration seems to wind up um, uh, doing the same thing to the newly transplanted uh, cells as, as well. Uh, nonetheless, you know, you know, the joke is that, uh, you know, gene therapy is, has been uh, 10 years away for the last 30 years. And, you know, I, I, uh, but one of these um, years, it, it will actually start uh, being an effective therapy. The other thing that I think, you know, from a scientific perspective, and this is where I'm focused um, um, in my academic lab and my company, so we're starting to understand the connections between different neurodegenerative diseases um, in a much more powerful way than before. You know, basically different neurodegenerative diseases, we have different names from Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's, ALS, et cetera. It basically comes down to what set of neurons is dying. You know, in Parkinson's, it's those dopamine producing cells, you know, deep in the middle of your brain. In Alzheimer's disease, it's more the cortex, you know, and in the football players who get, you know, um, uh, some of this uh, uh, front of temporal dementia, uh, it's, it's, you know, sort of a forward portion of, of the cortex. Um, so it really is just, you know, which type of cell is, is dying, but there's all sorts of connections. A lot of them have to do with defects in basically, you know, cellular uh, recycling, garbage removal. I mean, I, you know, neurons are present, you know, more or less since birth or, you know, relatively young age, they have to last you a lifetime. So, you know, you have to be constantly be turning things over, recycling them effectively. And when that breaks down, if it breaks down enough, the cells die. Um, and so it's, it's becoming very clear from uh, that this is an underlying theme, especially for Parkinson's ALS um, and some other um, neurodegenerative diseases. Alzheimer's will be the last one to be cured. It's the hardest by far. But, uh, um, you know, I think ALS and Parkinson's, we're starting to get a pretty clear understanding of what's going on. Okay, I think I will stop there. I have a few other random bullet points here that um, you can read, but uh, otherwise I think I will turn to uh, questions um, if anybody cares to ask, or I guess we have some in the chat. Well, I'll go ahead and um, start off by saying thank you, Matt. That was a fascinating talk. Um, I was particularly glad that you talked about the, the idea of a cure for Parkinson's. Um, I noticed in the title of your talk, it was hope and reality on the path to curing. And I did think that was a bit provocative in a sense. <laughs> I think that a lot of what I know of and learned about Parkinson's is that, you know, there is no cure, you know, it's really just a matter of managing your symptoms. Um, so it was really great to really hear about what, what you mean when people talk about a cure, you know, about the cell therapies yeah. and the genetic therapies, because it does remain a little obscure. If you know that, you know, your dopamine just isn't there, the cells have died, then how can there be a cure? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I, there will be a cure someday. I just don't know if it's going to be in my lifetime or, or not, but, um, but absolutely there's, there's no reason that this, that this can't be, uh, ultimately cured. Um, you know, the other trick is going to be catching it early enough before, you know, too much damage is done. Uh, so, you know, if you can implement something right at the stage, people are, you know, diagnosed, um, you know, for example, that prevents further cell death. You know, if you were able to keep 50% of those dopamine producing neurons, you'd be able to live a basically normal life, you know, close to it. But I think that is one of the, the, problems with Parkinson's is that people often don't get diagnosed. <clears throat> yep. Yep. I, I remember when I was starting to have symptoms, I went in to see a doctor and she said, uh, you're just stressed out. Why don't you try uh, some yoga? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, it'll, it'll be possible to diagnose it more accurately, you know, in part through um, 
things like automated monitoring of symptoms and things like that that'll, that'll make it possible to diagnose it earlier you know at the same time though i think we should um you know obviously be thankful for you know as hard as parkinson's disease is uh you know parkinson's before the invention of levodopa was much much worse <laughs> there's no question i would no longer be working etc if um, if it weren't for levodopa I thought it was really interesting how you saw that you had the definitive sort of diagnosis when you when you took the dopamine and you could just see the immediate effect. Yeah, that was really yeah. interesting. It felt uh, it felt wonderful. I do want to just take a minute to um, sort of recap one of the things that you said, which is that you um, it's how important it is to actually see a movement disorder specialist and not really rely on your primary care doctor or even your neurologist, a, you know, a garden variety yeah. neurologist. So I wanted to sort of remind all the members out there that if you're not already connected with a movement disorder specialist, then I encourage you to do so. And you can also, if you don't know about one, reach out to people, uh, members in your support group, because I know there are a lot um, lo of good local ones, especially even at Kaiser. So mm -hmm. uh, Todd, do you want to field to ask a question? Sure. Let me uh, start to chip away at some of these great questions in coming in through the Q&A feature. Uh, the first one is just a neat comment by Gerald supporting one of your slides, Matt, on exercise. He says, when I'm on a rigorous hike, I can be two, one to two hours late taking my right area, and I don't even notice it. Exercise is medicine. Yep. <laughs> so hallelujah for that. Uh, and related to that also, my friend Chad and my pickleball partner, Chad, says, uh, as a question that starts with actions with motivational salience, quote unquote, are said to cause the release of dopamine. I think most of us with PD get that good feeling when doing performance-based activities like sports. Does mm -hmm. So the question would be, does extensive repetition of such activities improve the dopamine producing ability of what brain cells we have remaining? Or, mm -hmm. or is it just- Yeah, a that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of the reasons why, you know, at, at diagnosis, people typically have lost, um, you know, over half of their dopamine producing cells at that point is because the remaining cells essentially can, you know, increase their production of dopamine to partly compensate. Mm -hmm. um, so until you've lost sort of like over half of the cells, you don't really have that huge of an impact on your ability to function at that point. Um, and so even with, you know, only 20% of the remaining cells or something like that, um, they absolutely can produce more dopamine um, to compensate. Um, and that's partly probably what exercise is doing. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions about is one form of exercise better than another, whatever, you know, that's hard to say, um, you know, probably just, you know, by far the most important is just whatever you're actually going to do on a regular basis. And, you know, by regular, I mean like every day sort of thing um, is, is what's best for you. Um, and the rest of it seems to be more or less obvious. Like some people um, find Tai Chi to be particularly useful. Um, you know, people have like balance problems or a lot of falling and stuff, you know, well, you work on balance, your balance will improve, right? I mean, that's that sort of thing. Um, but rigorous exercise absolutely produces, you know, um, dopamine. I mean, people talk about runner's high and stuff like that. It's it's not a joke. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you know, that's actually due to producing a rush of dopamine in, in your brain. Good. Thank you. Um, I think one of the, you know, you, you talked about the myths of taking, you know, dopamine or too much dopamine. And, and I think one concern that I've heard about is um, being sort of over medicated is causing dyskinesia. Um, I don't, it doesn't sound like you experienced that dyskinesia. Um, and how would you sort of, you know, respond to that if people are worried about taking dopamine, like if somebody was going to take it every 90 minutes, like you were, I think it could, it can cause dyskinesia. I mean, what, what is your understanding of the relationship there? Yeah. So dyskinesia is complicated because it turns out there's actually three different kinds of dyskinesia, but most people have what's called peak dose dyskinesia, which basically means that you just have too much dopamine and, you know, more or less, it feels like being over caffeinated, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so the, so how to say, so if I take two pills right now, then the 
then the levodopa in my brain will spike 30 minutes later, and that's when I might get dyskinesias. But if I take one pill now, it'll spike to a level that's half as high. So less likely to get dyskinesias, right? So by taking a smaller dose more frequently, you will actually reduce um, dyskinesias. So there's two separate issues. There's how much you take mm -hmm. and how frequently you take it. But the biggest issue for levodopa is taking a lot of it at once. The more levodopa you take in sort of one sh in one go, the bigger the spike, and that and that's what for most people causes dyskinesias. Um, there's other forms of dyskinesia um, which operate a little bit differently, but the principle is uh, fairly similar. So your your strategy of taking smaller doses more frequently throughout the day has has probably helped with eliminating that side effect for you personally. Yes, combined with um, taking resagiline on top of it, which helps to smooth it out a bit. Um, you know, it, as you get more advanced in the disease, it becomes harder and harder, though, I and mean, that's reality, right? And at some point, the there is kind of a fairly straightforward trade-off between treating the symptoms and getting dyskinesias. And it, it, in the extreme, especially after maybe 15, 20 years or something like that, mm -hmm. um, you may not be able to adequately treat the symptoms without dyskinesia. That's obviously where somebody like Michael J. Fox is at. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, but, you know, and for, then it's just up to the patient really to decide which do you prefer to be on with dyskinesias or to be off. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, for somebody like Michael J. Fox, the answer is on with dyskinesias. Um, but everybody kind of has to, it's, it's tricky at that stage. That's where, you know, going to a more extreme option like the surgery um, or, you know, this new ultrasound treatment or the duodopa pump, you know, pumping it directly, you know, that's where that can start to be a real option. If you, if you can no longer manage symptoms without dyskinesias at all, then I would definitely consider these other options. Great. Um, Matt, since I opened the can of protein ingestion versus levodopa, I'll, ha I'll have to field a couple of questions coming in from the, from the members. Uh, Yuki, for example, says, I can personally attest to protein interfering with dopamine absorption. How do you explain cinnamon not working after more than 10 grams of protein? Um, look, I... You know, if if that is the case for you, then you absolutely, then you need to work around it, mm -hmm. right? Um, but uh, it does not interfere with protein absorption. Um, exactly what, how it's related to um, the food is not clear. Um, it may have something to do with um, dopamine, uh, the levodopa getting into your brain or something like that, uh, but it's it's uh, definitely not due to um, absorption that much. Right. Is, and and is the clear. converse isn't true either, right? That 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 the protein would interfere with the with the activities of the dopamine. Um, not per se. Um, there, yeah. So you know. It, you know, if uh, for you, it clearly, um, you know, leads to some uh, implicate, you know, it reduces the effectiveness, uh, depending on when you take it, then, then you have to work around it. What I object to is people telling patients that in the absence of, you know, actual evidence that that's true for uh, that particular patient, um, uh, because, you know, Here's actual data, okay? Averaged over multiple um, uh, patients. Uh, there's, you know, curves here for taking uh, the pills immediately after a meal with high protein or low protein or no meal at all. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell that there's different curves there. This is the amount of levodopa in their blood. 
because mm -hmm. uh, they're all just right on top of each other. Right. right? No variation. They're just, yeah. It doesn't, it does not interfere, uh, interfere with absorption. That is not correct. Is that slide, Matt, in your deck? Uh, it's not in the deck. It's on the, my website, though. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Jerry, yeah. Some people do, uh, you know, high protein meals and stuff like that. I mean, in the same sense that, like, you know, you feel different after you eat too much meat and stuff like that. It's probably impacting something in the blood brain barrier or something. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I think a couple of people had asked for the references. So we can grab those off of Matt's website. And um, when we send out a summary of the webinar, we'll include those uh, references for those. And, and Monique has put his website into the chat for folks to grab. And if you if you highlight the text of the what you'd like to copy and then right click on that, you should have a copy option. Oh, this is yeah, this is the particular page on here where it goes through this issue and you know why people thought this was the case and mm -hmm. then you know uh, various studies that have um, you know looked at this very carefully and whatnot. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Thank you. That's great. There's also a fair number of questions coming in, in the chat about um, cognitive behavioral therapy. I know that you said that was one of the other drug, non-drug um, ther therapies, and we don't really hear that much about it um, with related to Parkinson's. Um, can you speak to um, any, you know, how does one go about getting that sort of therapy and, um, you know, what are sort of, how are some of the, what are some of the benefits of that? Yeah, yeah. So it's, um, it's interesting because um, cognitive behavioral therapy has um, been shown to be effective even over telehealth. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, there's been issues with like, um, uh, you know, getting reimbursement for, for telehealth services, but the pandemic has um, been, you know, sort of positive um, in that regard that, you know, more uh, insurers are willing to pay for it. And uh, so, yeah, with, I, I have HealthNet and um, they um, uh, specifically have a, a telehealth um, uh, uh, psychiatry services, which include cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I'd say overall, there's, there's evidence that doing it you know, live and in person with um, uh, with a therapist is probably still a little more beneficial over overall. But you know, um, anything is probably better than than nothing. Um, yeah. In any case, you know, it's um, it's really um, you know been shown to be effective for depression in general, um, but uh, even specifically. Uh, I review proposals for the for the Fox Foundation, and um, uh, one of the favorite ones I saw was you know a careful clinical trial for cognitive behavioral therapy specifically for Parkinson's disease, and the results were really quite impressive. Um, uh, it was is very carefully done and controlled, and um, so overall I was just uh, really uh, positive about it. So yeah, on my website I have a number of different uh, reviews of this and whatnot. Um, yeah, so the bottom line is, um, you know, if you talk to um, even even a primary care uh, physician uh, should be able to give you um, a referral, um, possibly for a telehealth version of it, um, but that still may be beneficial for many people. Great. I think uh, another good resource is the PD Active support groups if folks are yeah. Participating in those, they can ask around for references and uh, go offline and talk to folks about that. Um, Robert asks uh, around the topic, again, of orthostatic hypotension, are there any meds available to treat that specific symptom? Yeah, um, there are a number of meds that have been used um, off-label before, and then there's this um, new medicine specifically approved for it. Um, called uh, droxidopa. Um, and so it's worth talking to uh, 
uh, to your doctor about um, what the right options might be. I would say that, um, at least based on my own experience, I would start with um, probably non-drug interventions just to try to regulate uh, blood pressure through ensuring that you're well hydrated and things like that. I think part of the reason why it, it happened for me uh, the first few times on an airplane is probably just, you know, you, you get dried out on an airplane and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, but if it is serious, um, then I would um, certainly talk to a doctor about, um, about possible drug interventions there. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask a question now about, um, you know, computational biology. I noticed that that's something that you've um, focused on in your research. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it means, but it sounds like it's some kind of AI strategy for drug discovery. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you use the sort of computer aided mm -hmm. drug design and, and how that works and how it influences your your pharmaceutical drug discovery in, in sort of um, not maybe too technical terms so that we can yeah. fo follow it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, computer aid drug design has been around for, for a while. Um, you know, I sort of participate in the development of some of the methods in this field and, um, you know, it more or less comes down to, um, you know, can we design drugs a little bit more like an engineer or something like that, um, rather than doing things empirically when one analogy um, that's been made is, you know, if we made drugs the way we make, or sorry, if we made airplanes the way we, we made drugs, we would, um, you know, build like a whole bunch of different fuselages, a whole bunch of different wings and sort of combine them together and different things and sort of like push them off a cliff. <laughs> and then see how far it flies. And, you know, so if it crashes after a thousand feet, you say, okay, well, it's better than nothing. Let's, let's try and make it, you know, so it crashes after 2000 feet and, you know, you just keep iteratively improving things until eventually it, it works. Um, and that's kind of the way drug discovery is. Um, um, so, you know, with, in reality, um, airplanes these days are designed entirely on computer. Um, they never go into a wind tunnel or anything. Um, and uh, the first time they fly, um, you know, they work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because we understand all the physics underlying um, how airplanes fly. More or less understand the same thing about drugs, but uh, it's just a lot more complicated. In making a safe and effective drug is uh, one of the most extraordinarily difficult things um, that humanity has ever done. Um, much more complicated than landing somebody on the moon, really. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of frustration, of course, among patients, you know, why can't this be done cheaper, faster, et cetera, but um, you don't want it cheaper, faster, believe me. <laughs> um, and the FDA's pickiness about this stuff is, is a very good thing. Um, mm -hmm. countries where um, things are not um, as carefully controlled, people die. Um, and the U.S. has done um, overall, I mean, you know, they make mistakes sometimes like approving that Alzheimer's drug, which really should not have been approved. Uh, but overall, the FDA does um, a very good job of ensuring patients' uh, safety and that drugs that are marketed are actually safe and effective. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of um, you know tr clinical trials going on at UCSF, and I think a lot of the members in our community are, you know participate in those clinical trials at UCSF. Are you involved in any of the the clinical trials that are going on at UCSF? Um, not too many. Um, you know, I've I've been a participant in some clinical trials um, just to try to be a good citizen. Um, I encourage patients to participate if they can. Um, it's you know progress and developing new uh, therapeutics, et cetera, is just simply not possible without people participating. And um, something like you know over half of uh, clinical trials for Parkinson's disease fail because of lack of patient recruitment. Um, you know. Uh, so they don't even get to test their hypothesis. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I think uh, at the same time, there, there are a lot of clinical trials that probably shouldn't be done. Uh, 
just being honest. Um, uh, uh, testing things with marginal benefit and things like that. Um, I think, you know, it's a little easier to do these things in places where there's sort of a centralized health system. In the U.S., it's a lot more complicated. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the ones that we really need to focus on as a community are the ones that are really going to move the needle in terms of slowing progression of the disease. And Matt, along the lines of the FDA rigorous release processes and and the like, do you have have you studied up on HR eight five eight five yet? And do you have any sort of summary summary feedback you can give us on it? I have not. Um, so yeah, I'm afraid I I can't give you any um, thoughtful analysis of that yet. Gotcha. Well, I mean, then I, I will... you know I think it's there's no question that you know more money for it is good um yeah you know, I, I always have mixed feelings because i mean the, the best system for allocating money for biomedical research is just to give it to the nih mm. and then not micromanage right. how it's spent congress doesn't like that they like to, to micromanage how it's spent um uh but that being said you know um parkinson's and alzheimer's have been dramatically underfunded relative to the societal impact compared to other diseases like cancer, um, which have received a much larger share of biomedical funding. So anything that increases uh, the funding for research on biomedical, on uh, neurodegenerative diseases is uh, very important right now. I mean, cancer has, you know, made huge strides but that's on, you know, that's due to a massive investment from the public sector um, via the NIH and also the private sector investing, you know, $100 billion in, in clinical trials. And that's what's moved the needle there. Yeah. Parkinson's needs a lot more money, not just a little. And in case folks that are online now and the attendees that missed Monique's intro, uh, PD Active is is growing more and more advocacy friendly and um, putting together ways that we can support things like HR 8585 and keep your keep your eyes on your email for an event coming up later on in September along, along those lines. Thanks, Matt, for that plug. I think the event will be Monday, uh, September 19th, I think is what we're targeting um, because I think the 22nd of September is sort of a national day of action. Um, by the Michael J. Fox organization. And they're gonna be sort of a nationwide push to promote um, people reaching out to their legislators in support of eight, uh, HR 858, HR 858 or something. Yep. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, so in my twenties, I actually worked for a pharmaceutical company that sort of had plant-based um, strategies for drug, drug discovery. Um, and that was really fascinating. And I've always been interested in, you know, the power of plants. And I think there's a resurgence now, you know, in, in sort of plant-based powers to, for healing. Um, and to that note, I'm wondering if you're familiar with Macuna. Um, it's sort of the velvet bean plant. Um, and they've been able to synthesize, I think, the levodopa, you know, from this bean. Um, and I know you can buy it. And I'm curious, um, of what you think about the, the properties of, of that as a form of levodopa, either as you know in 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 you know in the adjunct or on it by itself. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm glad you asked about that. Um, it's very interesting. The um, the most visited page on my website is about natural sources of levodopa. Mm -hmm. Um. So the first thing I'll say is the, um, the levodopa that's in Mucuna is exactly the same as the levodopa in the pill. It's exactly the same as the levodopa in your brain. So there's absolutely no benefit to getting it from the plant as opposed to the pill. Um, uh, there's... Um, Mucuna happens to have a high level of levodopa. There was, however, an unfortunate um, case where uh, somebody died from King Mucuna recently um, for uh, somebody with Parkinson's disease. There's been a couple of these cases. 
Um, it's not entirely clear what happened. Um, it may be that there was a contamination in mm -hmm. it. Um, and you have to keep in mind that, um, uh, you know, supplements are not regulated um, by the FDA. I mean, not, and that's due to um, entirely due to political um, lobbying um, that they've been exempted from this. Um, so while, you know, the drugs uh, that you take have to be, you know, subjected to extraordinarily, extraordinarily high levels of scrutiny um, to ensure that um, it's safe and effective and that the, you know, it's processed in ways that are, uh, you know, they can march into your factory at any given time and inspect you and things like that. Um, uh, the same is not true um, for supplements and they're mostly allowed to basically just lie about, you know, what their effect is and uh, how safe they are and, and things like that. Um, so, you know, um, uh, there, there's no question that plants have been useful sources of, um, of drugs. I mean, everything from aspirin to, you know, well, levodopas have found in, in plants and animals, et cetera. Um, but, um, yeah, just take the pills. So I think the I think the main reason that you're saying would be discouraging people from Macuna that you could buy as a supplement is just that supplements aren't regulated, so you can't really ensure the quality of the product. The quality, you don't know how much is in there, and mm -hmm. I calculated at one point how much you would have to eat. It was a shocking amount of Macuna. I I've never tasted it, but I don't think you want to eat that much. It was like uh, to get the equivalent of like one cinema pill you need like 30 grams of mucuna powder um yeah. interesting so <laughs> that's a lot <laughs> that's a lot that's to a lot cereal in the morning yeah yeah and who knows what else is in there yeah okay good so as we could have predicted there are a few specific questions about specific drugs coming in from our attendees so i'll love you two at the same time if i can uh, what do you think about COMT inhibitors like entacapone? Yeah. And what do you know about taking Nurians to treat episodes, uh, off episodes? Those are Yeah. So the COMT inhibitors, um, they have an effect similar to um, the restagiline or azelec that I described, which is basically slowing down the degradation of uh, dopamine, can buy you a little bit extra time. So I think that's definitely worthwhile. There's also a convenient one pill option that includes the COMT inhibitor that for some reason is, is used um, frequently in, in Europe, less so here. Um, let me make sure I get the name of it right. Uh, sorry, hang on just a moment. Yeah, it's the uh, Stilevo as a COMT inhibitor in it. Um, and so, yeah, sort of in one pill, you get the benefit of that. Um, so that's that's definitely worthwhile. Good, thank you. You got anything, Monique, or would you like me to keep driving? I think you're on mute. You're on mute, yeah. Oh, why don't you keep going? I was just catching up with questions on the Q&A. Sure, let's see. Um, this is a rather specific one. Oh yeah, so here's another one. Is the pathology that is specific to PSP known? And I think PSP here is progressive supranuclear something else. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so there's a series of diseases that are sometimes called Parkinson's plus includes PSP, MSA, multiple systems atrophy, um, Lewy body dementia, um, related to Parkinson's disease in that um, they have similar motor symptoms. Um, uh, they're distinguished from Parkinson's disease in terms of having a faster rate of progression and um, more significant neuropsychiatric and dementia um, at diagnosis. Um, that's the PSP. 
is yeah, it is sort of cluster of diseases that includes PSP. Got it. Um, uh, they sometimes respond to levodopa well, sometimes don't. Um, in terms of the question, you know, specifically about do we understand the difference between it? It turns out we actually do at this point. Um, it's it's still caused by much of the same underlying pathology involving a protein called alpha synuclein, which um, um, uh, aggregates both in idiopathic Parkinson's and in these Parkinson's plus, including PSP. But it turns out that the form that's aggregating is slightly different um, with PSP, and we know exactly what it looks like now. Um, uh, uh, it, for reasons we don't fully understand, PSP just uh, you know, instead of just killing the dopamine producing cells that kills those, but also, you know, starts um, in the cortex rather early and starts leading to this variety of other other symptoms. So in certain respects, it's kind of like a mix between like uh, Parkinson's and frontotemporal dementia or something like that. Um, but it can be that. very difficult to diagnose correctly. Um, so if you got a, a correct diagnosis, that's a great first step. It can be a little bit more tricky to treat just simply because number of patients with um, these Parkinson's plus is, is smaller. And so there's just, an, uh, it, it's very important to go to uh, not only a movement disorders specialist, but there's really only a few places in the U.S. that do a great job of treating these diseases. Uh, one of them is UCSF, um, if you can get there. Good, thank you. I mean, even most new movement disorder specialists have maybe only seen a couple of cases in their career, right? but at, at the specialized centers, then, um, then they've seen multiple patients. Hmm. Um, thank you for that. That was interesting. Um, I'm not familiar with that disease, so that was interesting to hear about. Um, you did speak at one point about the commonalities of some of the neurodegenerative diseases and how that sort of was a, an indicator of progression. Um, I'm wondering about any thoughts on if there's any commonalities on the causes of Parkinson's disease and the other neurodegenerative diseases. I mean, what is there sort of your latest thinking about the causes of, of some of these, especially Parkinson's? Yeah, um, so that's uh, a complex area. Um, you know, idiopathic in medical speak basically means we don't know why you have this disease um, and uh, something like at least 80% of Parkinson's is idiopathic. Mm -hmm. um, the remaining, you know, 20% is interesting though, because in case in those cases, we actually do know what causes it, mainly genetics. Um, the genetics has taught us a lot. Um, you know, so there's obviously there's a huge amount of interest in alpha synuclein as a driver of it. And um, the sort of flip side of it is uh, uh, having to do with um, you know, recycling function, specifically recycling mitochondria. Um, you know, mitochondria creates all the energy for a cell, but they kind of burn out and so you have to recycle. I mean, it, that's, it's 100% uh, clear that in Parkinson's that sort of can break down and that can cause the, the disease. There's also a few percent perhaps um, uh, of cases which are caused by environmental factors. Um, one thing that disturbs me greatly is that, uh, you know, if you look at rates of Parkinson's disease, you know, between, say, the Bay Area and the Central Valley, it's higher in the Central Valley. Within the Central Valley, it's um, higher if you live closer to a farm. Um, and there's absolutely no doubt that um, certain pesticides um, can cause Parkinson's. Um, because we use um, those pesticides in lab experiments to create um, animal models of Parkinson's disease. Um, but yeah, if you think that uh, supplements are unregulated, uh, you know, pesticides are, um, it's, it's like uh, living in the upside down, you know, it's, it, in order to get them pulled off the market, you have to prove that they're harmful. And most of the testing for pesticides has to do with, you know, feeding it to lab animals in large amounts and seeing if they get cancer or something like that. Um, 
but you know things like neurodegeneration which develop over decades it's very very difficult to prove uh, causality um, but I'd say the balance of the evidence is there's no question that certain pesticides absolutely cause Parkinson's disease probably only a few percent um, but nonetheless um, you know it's preventable in, in that few percent which is unfortunate Yeah, I bet a lot of our members have read Ending Parkinson's, a, a recipe for action. Uh, if you haven't, go pick that up and give it a read because that covers a lot of good information on causality. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but the, the reality is at the end of the day that, you know, nobody can tell me why I have Parkinson's disease. Right. Because they can. <laughs> yeah. Probably just bad luck. Yeah. Uh, Christopher, as a, a thank you first, Nathan says, thanks for the great talk, especially dispelling myths authoritatively. I agree on that note. Uh, then he has two questions lumped into one. Is diagnosis still dependent on reaction to levodopa? What are alternative diagnoses if levodopa not as instantly effective? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just based on clinical um, examination. Um, you know, if you have the classic rest tremor, they'll, um, you know, readily diagnose you with Parkinson's disease. You know, if your symptoms are maybe a little bit atypical, then, you know, it might be a little more ambiguous. Um, uh, but, you know, usually it's based on, on the motor symptoms. Um, uh, but, you know, the average amount of time it takes between the motor symptoms coming on and getting a correct diagnosis is, you know, typically three to five years, I think, for many patients. Uh, you know, maybe a little faster if it uh, comes on more suddenly, but, uh, you know, it tends to come on kind of gradual. And you, you, know, you kind of feel something's wrong, but you're not really sure. And eventually you go to a doctor and they're not sure, you know, it takes a while. Uh, there is uh, neuroimaging. Um, a DAT scan that they can do, but it's not highly specific. So um, uh, it's it's not like it gives you a clear yes, no. So I, in general, I don't think it's terribly useful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one of our members, Joanne asks, um, if you feel the research on monoclonal antibodies is promising for slowing Parkinson's. Yeah, so basically these are the equivalent of the um, Biogen drug that was approved for Alzheimer's. Um, so the Biogen um, uh, antibody clears out um, A-beta, which is, you know, the protein that aggregates in Alzheimer's. There's a bunch of these um, in clinical trials right now um, for clearing out alpha-synuclein um, for, for Parkinson's. Um, you know, I have some hope for this, but one of them just um, just failed in clinical trials recently. Um, and, uh, you know, the rather disappointing results of the Alzheimer's ones, uh, you know, has unfortunately dampened my excitement about that route a little bit. But, uh, you know, fingers crossed, I think we'll know the answer definitively in the next... Uh, five years uh, for better or worse you know there's there's still let's say uh something less than 50 percent, but greater than zero chance that they'll that they'll succeed okay great thank you um todd do you want to have do you have any questions or uh let's see i'm scanning down through here um I'll, I'll field Mary Ann's real quick here. She's actually got a small number of excellent questions lumped into one request. Does levodopa promote excessive sleep? Hmm. You know, I'm not sure. Uh, most Parkinson's patients have some sort of sleeping issues, either interrupted sleep or, you know, too little, too much. You know, there's a lot of variations. Um, yeah. Levodopa, I mean, it's broadly speaking, it's kind of a stimulant. So you might think that it would um, interfere to some extent. Um, and uh, a lot of people wind up using some sort of sleeping aid to, to help. Um, but I don't know that there's been any really clear studies, you know, really dissecting that. Okay. 
Okay. I mean, how much of it is due to the disease versus the drug, right? Because most advanced patients wind up on levodopa eventually. And so, right. you know, is it the levodopa or is it just the disease? Right, right. Hard to tell when it's blended like that. But that's one of the questions that I always have about, um, you know, in the slide where you showed that more advanced patients need more levodopa. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's one of the sort of things that I've always wondered about. And you kind of alluded to it, that it's not necessarily that it's the dopamine that's causing you to you need more dopamine. It's just the natural progression of the disease over time and yeah, yeah. age. Yeah. I mean, when you're diagnosed, if you have like half of your dopamine producing cells left, you know, 10 years later, maybe you have 20%. So yeah, you need to take more. Mm-hmm. Let's see, uh, you alluded that diet and supplements cannot help Parkinson's, but there are, but are there any changes you can recommend in these categories that may help with symptoms? For example, keto diet, mannitol, and the like. Yeah, a lot of things have been tried, a lot of different dietary, um, you know, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to do good clinical trials for diet. Mm. Um, because how do you control for it? How do you ensure that people are adhering to the diets and everything? It's, it's, yes. uh, these are long clinical trials, extraordinarily expensive and, and difficult to carry out. Mm -hmm. um, so the issue there is not so much that, you know, it, 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 it's an absence of proof, right? That isn't proof of absence, but, um, you know, the, uh, my guess is probably like exercise, eating well is going to be better, right? <laughs> Yeah. Whether or not there's anything specific to Parkinson's disease, um, it's just not known. I mean, there have been trials of keto diet and stuff and um, without success thus far. Um, but as I said, it's an extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult area um, to do rigorous science in. Okay. Yeah. So unfortunately, there are just no good answers. Um, Gerald has a question about, I think, you know, are there any specific medications that he could take um, for a particular symptom that he's having, like when he's playing the guitar, his fingers aren't moving very well. So mm -hmm. I guess that's sort of under the category, maybe a fine motor yeah. um, skills. Yeah. And are there particular medications, um, you know, that might be better for that than other symptoms? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much just your levodopa there. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's uh, just uh, pretty much just uh, standard motor symptoms. Um, uh, so yeah, it's pretty much just the classic levodopa or dopamine agonists, um, risagiline, et cetera. They all, they all help to varying extents, but levodopa is the most effective for motor, yeah. for motor symptoms. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, those sort of fine, especially fast um, movements are particularly difficult for Parkinson's patients. Um, and it's the sort of thing where you might do well for a few minutes, but um, over time, it's like your fingers are getting tired. And it's mm -hmm. not so much that they're getting physically tired, it's that your brain is getting tired. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe Gerald should uh, check in with his um, medical facilities um, occupational therapy department. See if they might have any recommendations for exercises he can use to improve that activity. Yeah, yeah, occupational therapy um, can be helpful. Um, uh, yeah, getting somebody uh, good who's had experience with Parkinson's patients obviously is is the challenge, but uh, uh, but there there are some good people out there. Mm -hmm. Well, we are running up against the two hour mark. We have just um, had so many great questions coming in and this has just been such a fantastic conversation. So if anybody has any last minute questions, feel, feel free to put them in the chat and we will try to address them. Um, before we sort of wrap up, I do wanna put one more plug in for our fabulous uh, classes that we offer at Pediactive. Um, Matt spoke to this in his talk, how exercise is just hands down one of the best things that we can all do. To, to control our symptoms and slow, and even potentially slow down the progression. So please um, look at our wonderful classes that we have online. Um, and we do also have, I just wanna point out that we do also have a tremolos class that meets uh, three, three or four times a month. Um, and that's specifically for voice training. It's a choral based class that um, 
does some of the um, things that you were talking about in terms of voice training. So please feel free to That's terrific, yeah. check out those classes that we offer all online. Right. Excellent. Here's another drug specific question, Matt. Does sertranine and lamotrigine interact with carbidopa levodopa? Um, that one I will have to, if you email me that question, I will uh, look it up. I don't want to say something off the top of my head and be wrong. Fair enough. Don't think so. Levodopa doesn't interact with too many things. Um, the one drug where you have to worry about interactions a bit is, uh, you know, the resagiline or azelect. Um, it's what's called a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And if you take other drugs that are also monoamine oxidase inhibitors, you can have some drug drug interactions there. Um, but uh, yeah, the pharmacists are well acquainted with that issue and will help you sort it out. There's a question here from Marge about gloves that have magnets in the fingertips. Um, she says she yeah. this through the Michael J. Fox Foundation. I guess it's a, maybe a form of deep brain stimulation that you do yourself, or I, I don't know. Do you know anything about that, Matt? Yeah, let's see. What was the story there? Um, yeah, somebody invented this, and then um, somebody's selling those, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I think the idea is to give you some, it's it's not like deep brain stimulation in terms of like, you know, uh, how to say, you know, putting electrodes in your brain, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, obviously quite inv invasive. But I think the idea of these is that um, by having sort of like biofeedback, it helps you to control, you know, tremors and things like that. Um, and uh, there's a number of clever um, solutions. Oh, one of my favorite along these lines um, is the spoon um, <laughs> that counteracts your tremor. Oh, yeah. You know, so people have trouble um, feeding themselves, you know, uh, due to tremor, which, you know, I occasionally have, um, you know, tremors that bad that, you know, the food's falling off the spoon or whatever. Um, yeah. It's it's quite effective because it it just um, directly counteracts that that tremor. Um, that right. can be very effective, and they didn't, it doesn't even cost that much. I don't think. I haven't heard about that. What is what is that called, Todd? Do you know about that? I've heard about it and seen it uh, advertise, advertised. It's basically got a gyroscope built into the handle, so as your tremor yeah. goes one way, the spoon itself absorbs that direction and sort of flops the opposite direction. So it's it's, it's a little bit of a flopping fish effect. Yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, looks like there's a couple different versions out there, but yeah, for people who have, um, you know, real problems with, um, uh, uh, you know, some of them are cheaper and I don't know if the cheaper ones work, you know, as well as the <laughs> more expensive ones or whatever, but, uh, yeah, for people who have trouble, um, feeding themselves, even on just on Amazon, you can find if you just type a uh, Parkinson's spoon or something like that, uh, there's various options. That's great. Um, Marion has a follow-up question about Abilify. Does Abilify take levodopa out of the brain? Does it remove the levodopa? Abilify is, Abilify is an atypical antipsychotic, which means that it does not work by, um, by depressing the, the dopamine system. So um, in principle, that means that it could be appropriate for Parkinson's patients, the atypical antipsychotics. It's what the so-called typical antipsychotics that operate by um, uh, depressing the dopamine systems. I think that's it, Monique. Well, there's one other question. We have one minute. <laughs> From okay. David, is there any compositional difference between generic cinemat and regular cinemat, like differences in fillers, et cetera? And can those differences cause side effects? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, in terms of the active ingredients, by definition, the generics have to be shown to be equivalent, right? That's how they get approved. That does not mean, however, that the inactive ingredients are necessarily the same. And they do have to show that it has 
approximately the same behavior as the um, non-generic pills in terms of dissolution and all these things, mm -hmm. um, but they're not necessarily identical. Most of the time, these little differences don't matter. But in the case of Parkinson's disease, where you know it's you know it, it, this drug is such a central part of people's life, you know sometimes when they try different. Uh, you know, formulations of it, you know, sometimes it just works a little bit better than others, depending on exactly what the formulation is. And so, you know, um, there are cases where, um, you know, patients have felt like their pills weren't working as well. And it turns out that there was some small change in how they were made. Uh, a few years ago, there was an example of this. Um, so there's, there's small differences um, can matter. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of people don't wind up using the extended release formulations because for whatever reason, um, well, one of the reasons is because they, they don't um, get absorbed as quickly. And so, you know, instead of, you know, waiting 15 minutes or 30 minutes to start feeling the effects, you know, maybe it takes longer. That's supposedly what the Ridery um, solved Ridery, um, the early version of Ridery, they literally just sort of like glued together an extended release and an immediate release. So you take it, the immediate release gives you an immediate impact, and then the extended release gives you an impact, you know, two to three hours later. The current version of it, it's a little more sophisticated than that. But uh, um, anyways, these, these fine differences, you just kind of have to find what works for you. Well, I know you said that you take the extended release at night, and why not take the extended release during the day also? Yeah, yeah, just because I find that it takes a little longer to kick in. Mm. Yeah, but I've never tried the writery, um, you know, partly because my insurance didn't want to pay for it. So, um, you know, maybe if I keep fighting eventually, they will. But, <laughs> but paying for it out of pocket is exceedingly expensive. Mm. Interesting. Well, I think that's a wrap on this uh, fantastic forum. I, uh, it was so wonderful to have you join us, Matt. Thank you so much. Yep, for my pleasure. Yeah, you can uh, send me any other further questions that come in or whatnot, and I'll be glad okay. to try to respond. Okay. All right, well, thank you to uh, all of you for the invite and okay. sharing thank this uh, Saturday morning thank with you. me. Thanks we'll, for your time on the weekend. We'll send out thank a you. summary um, um, follow with the link, link to the YouTube recording um, after yeah. next week, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Right, bye. Happy weekend, everyone.